Thanks very much, Bill. It's a great pleasure to be here and especially to follow such great presentations um, from, from Gopi uh, and, and Luis. Um, let me see. I think. Up there? Yeah. Oh, terrific. Great. Okay. So, four questions here. Why is trade a priority area? Um, some pressing research questions in the trade area. Some new research methodologies that let us provide better answers to some of those questions. And then a little discussion on communication of findings. So why is trade a priority area? I think if you listen to the daily news, you might hear that trade is a source of all problems. It needs to be stopped right now. Um, but in fact, I think the, I, I'd like to put exactly the opposite proposition. Why is trade important? Well, there are real income gains, gains from trade. No static, even the static gains seem to be quite substantial. In my background paper, I look at work on Japan's opening up back in the 1860s um, after a visit by a certain Commodore uh, Perry. Um, the static gains turn out, income gains from that largely agricultural economy turn out to be very, very substantial, 10% of GDP. Um, as well as that, you have the gains from the differences in, in technology between sectors and so on. These are the points um, that Ricardo emphasised back in the 18th century. Um, dynamic gains from higher productivity. We now have the detailed data to pick those up. Work by Mary Amiti and Joseph Konings, for instance, in the American Economic Review, point out that those gains, if you have lower cost intermediate inputs, you get big increases in productivity, which are in addition to the static gains that our textbooks um, tell us about. It's especially important in agriculture liberalisation because agricultural trade barriers tend to be enormously variable across commodities. They range from Japan, for instance, from zero on feed grains um, and soybeans uh, for, used for feed um, to maybe 900% on rice. And not only do trade barriers in agriculture vary over, across commodities dramatically and much more than in manufacturers, um, they vary a lot over time as countries try to stabilise their domestic prices at the expense, of course, of destabilising world prices and the prices faced by producers in open economies like the United States. Um, what we, we, we found, um, Kim Anderson and I, in a study, we found that this tiny agricultural sector, less than 10% of world trade, contributed about two-thirds of the global gains from further, agri further trade reform, from elimination of trade barriers, because those barriers were so high, and high barriers are the ones that are very costly, um, and they're so distorted, so prevalent, so common. I think another thing that we need to do as, as economists interested in trade reform is to more go on the offensive. We hear these stories, anecdotes all the time of how opening to trade causes all this volatility and poor, vulnerable producers can't, um, can't cope with that. What we have to remember is that the absence of trade leads to a ghastly, terribly, terribly volatile situation. Um, and I'll provide some numbers there. Burgess um, and Donaldson have a very interesting study in India where they look at what happened when regions of India opened to trade as the railroads came through. And the incidence of famines fell dramatically. No longer did you have a situation where people starved to death because of poor rains in, an, in, in a particular area. It was possible to move food to the people in need. Just to illustrate this, yes, I, I was looking at this for Morocco for a presentation there. Um, if you look at the volatility of wheat yields um, in, in Morocco, it's five times the volatility. That's a coefficient of variation, a very standard measure of volatility. Five times the volatility um, of world production. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't rely solely on what you produce um, domestically. Trade gives you diversification, gives you costless reduction in volatility. I think an important 
other theme I'd like to emphasize today is the increasing importance of developing countries. When we, we hear about agricultural trade liberalization, we're very used to hearing stories of uh, reductions in trade barriers in Japan, in Europe. These are, these are very, very important because many of those barriers are so high. Um, but the world has really changed. You go back a couple of decades, in the early 90s, about 40%, 39% of world trade went from one um, industrial country uh, exporter subject to full WTO disciplines to another. Um, 60, almost 60% of exports of agricultural products went from the industrial countries to, um, <clears throat> you know, to globally. 49% developing countries only exported to 41% um, of total exports. Move forward 20, roughly 20 years, um, and I should emphasize these figures are trade excluding intra-trade within the European Union. There's an enormous amount of intra-trade within the, within the U European Union, only a small part of which will go, we moved outside the European Union after Brexit. Um, about 20% of world trade is the stuff we're interested in, the stuff that's subject to WTO rules. Um, it's not within Europe. And of that, only 20% of world trade is now exports from one high-income country to another. Exports from high-income countries have fallen to about 42% um, of, of world trade. Um, and more of those exports are to developing countries than um, to uh, high income countries. Developing countries now account for about almost 60% of world trade. In fact, if I update these numbers, I'm sure that will be the case. Another reason that developing countries are very important in terms of trade liberalization is what's been happening. If you go back, and this draws on Kim Anderson's mammoth study of agricultural distortions down at the World Bank. If you go back into the 50s and 60s, developing countries taxed agriculture, wanting cheap food um, for the urban populations who are much more influential. But what we've seen from the early mid-90s is a shift towards protection of agriculture, almost all the time except during the 2008 food crisis when protection came down. Um, that elimination of agricultural taxation, replacement of it in many cases with export, with import barriers means um, that developing countries are hugely important in the trade agenda. Suppressing research questions, well one is going to be forecasting the future of agriculture um, and as Jill mentioned this morning, um, we're going to see a big increase in world population out to 2050 and that's going to be um, an important source of demand. But worldwide, population growth is slowing down, slowing down a great deal. Um, income growth is going to be the really big driver. Dri in growth in incomes per person in developing countries is going to be the big driver of global food demand. I did some calculations from some work I'm doing with Amuko Fakasi. About 60% of the increase in food demand out to 2050 looks like it's going to come from income growth in developing countries. As consumers move away from consumption of staple foods, towards increased consumption of livestock products. Of course, this is, there's a subtext here. This is good for uh, Illinois and Iowa, producers um, of livestock feeds. Um, it's less good for producers of staple feeds, uh, regions like Kansas and Thailand and Australia um, producing the, the staple food. So income growth, I think, is going to be terribly, terribly important, and it's income growth in developing countries. Income growth in rich countries doesn't do much to increase demand for food because many of the richest countries are quite near association. Climate change impacts, I think, are going to be very, very important. I think the scientific evidence suggests that climate change is not a hoax. It's going to be real. It's going to have very strongly differentiated impacts um, in particular areas, and they're going to be awfully important. Biofuels, actually, there was enormous upsurge of research on that in recent years. In recent years, it's gone very, very quiet. But there are some key questions there. What's going to happen with the blend wall that's limiting expansion? What's going to happen to energy prices? 
and uh, are liquid transport fuels, which is where the action is, are they going to be replaced by electric vehicles? So there are going to be some interesting um, issues there that I talk about in the background paper. Trade policy, I think it's unlikely we're going to see big trade rounds. To me, that's unfortunate. I've written three books um, on WTO rounds, one on the Uruguay round, two on the Doha agenda. Um, it's not a fascinating thing to come to grips with the, the intellectual challenges of those negotiations. Sorry? <laughs> very short, very short. Thank you very much. And we're not likely to see big WTO accessions on the order of magnitude of China, um, on which I, I prepared another um, big study. Okay, but the National Regional Bilateral Agenda is active, including we're having a lot of work done now on Brexit, the implications of that, what to do. The IATRC had a fascinating session, a Trade Research Consortium, um, uh, on that. I think economists are going to need to be really, really dismal scientists on a lot of the proposals for raising trade barriers. Um, a trade barrier, we need to remind people, a trade barrier is a tax on the export sectors. Export sectors like agriculture in the United States doesn't do anything, they don't do anything to reduce the trade deficit. All they do is choke off an equal amount of exports for the amount of imports that they save. Collective action problems haven't gone away. Problems with levels of market access, levels which are rising because they're no longer, they're in, especially in developing countries, they're not constrained um, substantively um, by WTO bindings in ag on most agricultural products. And with price volatility um, that results from price insulation, this is the old grandstand problem, everybody stands up to get a better look, nobody gets a better look. Com many countries use insulating policies to avoid price volatility at home, that magnifies price volatility uh, in the rest of the world. You see how large that is. This graph here, the blue line is domestic food prices, um, the, world, the red line is world prices. It looks like a great success in developing countries stabilising domestic prices, but in fact it's created most of the volatility in world market prices. Food security and nutrition, huge agenda issues here. The main problem for hunger is access to food. Trade can't <coughs> ensure food security, but it certainly can help. Amartya Sen's famous work pointed out most of those famines that he's covered in that famous book were actually due to a lack of imports of food where it was needed to help people get access to food. Many countries focus on availability. I was recently in sub-Saharan Africa looking at countries where they, they're targeting availability and creating a lot of, of price volatility. Stockholding in developing countries needs to work with trade policy. Often it doesn't. There's very interesting work by Christoph Gowell on this. Um, and trade can really help improve dietary diversity. And that just hasn't received nearly enough attention. Data, we need good data and parameter estimates. Protection data are improving. We have an initiative that brings together um, half a dozen sources of agricultural trade distortion measures. IFPRI is curating it, bringing together work from OECD, FAO, Inter-American Development Bank, World Bank and others. Um, our behavioural estimate, parameter estimates are getting very, very, data, uh, very dated. We've got much more detailed data, big data here, on transaction data, on production and trade, household data global agroecological data. All of these let us do a lot more of what Gopi and Luis called for, identify the gainers and losers. And as part of our profession, economists as Jeremiah's, we're really going to need to point out that when people raise trade barriers, people get hurt. We hear about the adjustment costs associated with lowering trade barriers. The adjustment costs of raising trade barriers are even higher. New methodologies, value chain analysis lets us look beyond one sector. Randomised control trials, a great wave of innovation in, the, in, the, in agricultural economics, um, been using them in combined with economy-wide models, I think is important. Some of Ed Taylor's work. And the use of gravity models to estimate welfare gains from reform. Here, Gopi and his colleagues have been leaders looking, using these new techniques to capture the impacts um, of 
trade agreements, different types of trade agreements. Research and communication. Um, I think the really important thing that we haven't done enough, economists haven't done enough, is to identify decision makers, talk to the decision makers. In fact, it's best to talk to the decision makers first at meetings like this um, and to refine the questions, conduct the research. Conducting that research is really important to do it rigorously, transparently, present it at conferences like the AAEA meetings. Um, and the International Association of Agricultural Economists has a big meeting coming up in August in Vancouver next year. Hope you can all be there. But that's important, the transparency, the scrutiny, scrutiny refereed journals to ensure the quality, and then um, the dis dissemination and communication of findings. And of course, researchers need to anticipate the, the need for, for results so that they can be supplied in a timely, in timely manner. Karen, um, I can see you're worried. My final slide. There are many exciting and important questions for researchers in international trade. We have some new techniques that provide opportunities to answer those questions um, in interesting, convincing ways, including capturing the impacts on households and firms that, where we haven't done a good enough job in the past, we can now do that with the new tools that are available to us. And there are new opportunities and challenges in communicating research results, and I'll be happy to talk afterwards. Thank you.